Dr. Marek Khodikovic currently serves as a professor of history at the Institute of World Politics, where he holds the Kozhushko Chair of Polish Studies. And he also leads the Institute of World Politics Center for Intermarium Studies. Dr. Khodikovic has authored numerous works in both English and Polish, including the book Intermarium, The Land Between the Black and Baltic Seas, which is a depiction of the eastern borderlands of the West on the rim of the former Soviet Union, and On the Right and the Left, 2013, which is a textbook of the intellectual history of certain modern ideologies. Uh, he has also translated and edited the correspondence of the Ulam family of Lvov to the mathematician Stanislav Ulam at Harvard from 1936 until after the Second World War. Dr. Hodakovich has also authored a number of articles and columns for on foreign policy and politics in the Journal of World Affairs, American Spectator and Crisis Magazine. Dr. Hodakovich, welcome to Vonday Radio. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. God bless. Before well, we start. Thank you very much. Uh, and have I'm sure many of our listeners are familiar with uh, Poland's current travails and the resistance that at least a large part of Polish society is to showing to the, the globalist monoculture, the liberal cultural Marxist ideology that is, is growing in strength across the world. And your articles in crisis in particular were illustrative of the dynamics of Polish politics, particularly with the recent uh, circumscription of, of certain abortion limits in, in Poland and uh, exposed some of the, the, the cultural dynamics at play there. So Poland is justly renowned as a bastion of the Catholic faith in the east of Europe until recently, similarly as Ireland in the west of Europe. And I wanted to discuss with you the history of Poland's relationship with the Catholic faith and beginning with Poland's baptism under Mishko I. So, uh, Dr. Hodukovic, could you please begin with a, a little synopsis of Poland's adoption of Christianity in 966, undoubtedly the most crucial moment in Poland's history? Absolutely. Uh Number one, there is an overarching theme. Uh, the Polish anthem goes, Poland has not perished yet so long as we live. It means that Poland is not a state. It doesn't requir require any boundaries or any organization and institution. It's within the individual. So long as you live and fight for freedom and fight for what is right, so long as you do not give up, no matter how many times you lose, everything will be honky-dory. Uh, mainly because it's been promised to us that the gates of hell shall not overcome the kingdom of heaven. It doesn't matter if in our current life, when we're here on earth, we fight the good fight and we don't succeed so long as we fight like Braveheart. We don't have to win, we just have to fight. Hopefully we'll win. Sometimes it happens that we win. For instance, the Poles in 1920, uh, Lord Dabernon called it the 18th more, most decisive battle in history when the Polish armies stopped the Bolsheviks at the gates of Warsaw. The only time in history when the Soviet Union lost in the field a major war and sued for peace. The only time in history. Who would have known? Little puny tiny Poland took on a giant and persevered. The Poles called it, by the way, the victory. Uh, they call it the miracle on the Vistula and credit Our Lady, who is the queen of Poland, by the way. So Poland is a monarchy. No matter what system uh, there is in Poland, no matter who rules Poland, there is 
uh, always Our Lady since the middle of the 17th century uh, when she was officially proclaimed by the King of Poland. Uh, he ceded his crown to her and said that she was the queen. She's been the queen ever since, and I think before too. In any event, that's the metaphysical, if you will. As, as far as uh, the old story, it starts with DNA. Several thousand years ago, people, it turns out the people who arrived in Europe from Eurasian steppes share the same DNA. They are Slavic people. They've been around for a long time. Some of them moved back and forth. It's speculated, again, based on this new DNA research, that some of them may have been the Aryan invaders of India. So Adolf Hitler got that one wrong too. <laughs> Not only the usual. Uh, the, the most seminal event is rather recent, a little bit more than a thousand years ago. A prince of the Polonia, a large and dominant tribe of the region, accepted Christianity and a Christian wife from Prague, a Czech princess, Dobrovka. Lesson learned love, not fire and sword. Mm -hmm. The lesson had not been internalized by the Poles, Western neighbors, the Saxons, who had been slaughtered by the Franks for 200 years before they fully embraced Christianity. Uh, sometimes upon their victory, the Franks would simply baptize all the captives and slaughter them so there would be no apostasy. That kind of barbarity had no place in Poland. Nobody died. Jesus came with love. The lesson is very important. When the last pagan people of Europe, the Lithuanians, who presided over uh, the continent's largest monarchy, their grand dukes, ruled over mostly Orthodox Christian Ruthenians, and most of their boyars were Orthodox by faith too. The Grand Dukes and their court turned west to Poland, and the Grand Duke of Lithuania married the uh, King of Poland. Her name was Hedwig. It was not an early example of gender bending. Simply, in Poland, there was no Salic law, which is a barbarian Germanic invention, barring women from inheriting. So when the last Piast dynast of Poland died issueless, his lords, mostly of Krakow, selected a princess who was related to the English monarchs. Her name was in Polish Jadwiga Andegaweńska, in Norman, it was Hedwig d'Anjou, a princess of Hungary. Her father was the king of Hungary. So to make sure everybody knew, she was a Plantagenet. So to make sure everybody knew that the throne of Poland was occupied, she was crowned in the, in the Krakow Cathedral. Please go there and check out her grave if you think I'm joking. She was crowned king, and on her grave it says, not Regina, but Rex Polonia. <laughs> Jadwiga Rex Polonia. So the king of Poland married the Grand Duke of Lithuania, and again there was love. No one died, no fire and sword. And this, in the 14th century, gave an impetus to a famous relationship, which eventually resulted uh, because of this Christian, very Christian approach, resulted in Europe's greatest success story, at least in the early modern period, namely what became a Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. 
I can go Christopher Dawson on you and talk about the utilitarian issues, how the church set up schools, uh, ran administration from uh, the 10th century. And this is all true, but it will be all too human. I think love must be recognized, Christian love as a driving force in that crazy place called Poland, the medieval kingdom of Poland, and in the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. Otherwise, the whole narrative won't make any sense. This is the spiritus moment. So what were the, the contours of the Middle Ages in Poland? Because is it, is it correct to say that the feudal system was not as refined in Poland and, and Central Europe? And is it so, true that the Jagiellonian period was, was a golden age? Uh, okay. Well, you know, we all stand on the shoulders of giants. So I'm not going to disrespect your great-grandfather and great-grandmother by claiming that you are the greatest, even though I admire you. <laughs> uh, same with medieval Poland. It was a, um, a slow evolutionary process that Poland became Christianized and civilized the Latin way. It could have chosen, like Ruthenia to the east, to embrace Byzantine Christianity. But the Poles, from the very beginning, uh, not only rejected Orthodoxy, Eastern Orthodoxy, but they also valued the papacy as a, a pivot to orient the nation towards. Why? Well, the neighbor to the West was the Holy Roman Empire with all its pretensions, with its Byzantine statism, which greatly diluted Western Christendom in the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation. So to see a powerful center of spirituality, administration, law in Rome, made sense not only from the point of view of the spirit, but also geopolitics. Geopolitically, uh, even though the papal states were not as powerful and the Pope's authority uh, not as pronounced as the Holy Roman Emperors, it's always good to have an alternative power center so that one may not dominate the continent to plagiarize the famous British geopolitical opinion about the balance of power. The Poles from early medieval times oriented themselves uh, towards Ro Rome. Uh, they sometimes would succumb and fall into a state of dependency when the emperors were more aggressive and more assertive and more successful in war. But uh, for the most time, Poland would stay true to Rome. To Rome. And that's a salient uh, feature. And unlike in France, they didn't, the Poles didn't find it contradictory to their national development. So in France, you were either or, you know, either Gallican church or Transmontane or Ultramontane. Not so in Poland. A Latin Christendom, exactly like Christopher Dawson taught us, brought institutions, law, and civilization, which did not negate what had been before, but infused with Christianity, Rome, Athens, and Jerusalem, uh, what was shaping to be the medieval kingdom of Poland. But as I said, the Poles didn't blindly embrace the European Union. And uh, they did not jettison their own arrangements, which they felt were just, for instance, women inheriting. 
I remember a Dutch historian bragging how in the second half of the 19th century, women could inherit in the Netherlands. Really? Had they been kneeling down before Our Lady and female saints, they wouldn't have had a problem with women in power. This is, as you know, it's, it's a common affliction of um, the Protestant revolution, mm. eliminating women. Uh, so that Christianity of that sort becomes an all-male affair. Not so much in Poland. Medieval Poland thrived. And in fact, uh, the Poles credit Our Lady with interceding during Black Death. There wasn't much Black Death mm. in Poland. You can chalk it up to Poland being isolated, but uh, uh, Poland had a very smart king, Casimir the Great, who essentially posted guards at the borders. There were really no illegal immigrants who survived that uh, sort of border protection measures. Latin culture became established along with what irresistibly flows from the beauty and logic of feudalism. What does it mean? You are my sovereign, I serve you. You give me a couple of villages to sustain me and my team of troops, my knights. I keep a castle for you. It, it is all yours. That has been the rule of all civilizations, a patrimonial state. You are like God because you're, you are the owner of everything. Not so much in Latin Christendom because of feudalism. I'd go to you and say, sire, I serve you faithfully and well. Please allow me to keep those villages for myself so I could will them to my children so they could serve you too. The beginning of property lies in feudalism and that in turn is informed by Christianity and its notion of fairness. Therefore you say yes. If you said, if you, if you, your majesty said so to your baron, then I have to say so to my knights. Then there are free farmers, not serfs, but free farmers. They want land too, the burghers as well. So gradually, property rights spread and property rights undergird freedom. Freedom without chains, but naked, is only good enough for Rousseau, not for Christians. Hence, the pivotal role of feudalism. Uh, how well was it developed in Poland? Well, it stopped on Poland. It also, it had its quirks. For example, between 10 and perhaps 15% of the population of Poland it has noble roots because Poland had no property requirements. It just had service requirements. The Dukes of Mazovia ennobled entire villages. Mm. What the English know as the yeomanry or the Welsh longbowmen in Poland, they would be petty nobility everybody with a coat of arms, mm -hmm. uh, two cows, a horse, and a sword. The noblesse de village. Yes, and sense. noblesse oblige because you lost your nobility if you refused to serve. So you couldn't be a slacker. You, could, you had to exercise your rights, which entailed obligations. There slowly developed in medieval times a variety of arrangements. Shortly after your uh, Magna Carta, which as you know, was a joke at the time, John Lackland was looking to dupe everybody. A, a Polish Duke 
issued an act of Chenya a few years later, it, also in early 13th century. The act of Chenya stipulated baronial and warrior participation as well as some other arrangements for the rest. Except it was not a joke, it was the beginning. Then a, another duke, soon after, issued a statue of Karish, which guaranteed the Jewish people safety. For instance, if anybody wanted to accuse them of ritual murder, he'd have to produce nine witnesses. And you know what they did in medieval Poland to liars? They branded them on their foreheads with hot irons. <laughs> it was very difficult to find nine uh, people ready to perjure themselves. So this introduced safety measures while keeping Christianity supreme, of course, it allowed for those who either missed the boat or were wrong in some way. This is naturally while the supremacy of Latin Christendom was unchallenged. A, after the death of the last Pia's king, the newly elected king wanted his nobility before the Jagiellonians, the Hungarian one, to participate in a foreign war. Well, the warriors didn't want to go because they were ready to kick anyone's butt who invaded, but why go and attack somebody? Unless they were Saracens, you know, then that would be justified in some way. But we are here to defend the realm, not to turn neoconservative and travel all over the world and force people to do things they don't want to. Do you understand we're still in medieval times? We're not in uh, the golden age of the Jagiellons. It was the medieval times, Christianity and local arrangements which provided the foundations for the future glory. Uh, once there was a personal union at the end of the four, uh, 14th century between the Kingdom of Poland and the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, the Lithuanian lords and their retinue, like my family, began clamoring for the same rights. Why? because the Grand Duke of Lithuania behaved like a Mongol Khan. He was a patrimonial lord. He was the Alpha and Omega on earth. So his nobles who embraced Christianity, Latin Christianity, mostly Samogitians or what we call modern ethnic Lithuanians, wanted property rights, wanted everything that the nobility of Poland had. And the latter, most generously in 1413, by a special act of union, bestowed their coats of arms on uncouth barbarians like my family. That is, don't take me wrong, the top people from the Grand Duchy of Lithuania were already awarded uh, feudal accoutrements when they first visited Krakow because uh, what is the precedent to sit anybody down? <laughs> when the Grand Duke comes, he's the Grand Duke, but what about his followers? They are nothing. Well, we are Europeans, meaning we follow Latin Christendom, we recognize dignity of every single person, but we also uh, uh, do pay attention to distinctions. So how do we distinguish them? Let's give them coats of arms. Hence the proliferation of nobility, mm. uh, which is confusing to everybody in Western Europe, for instance, we have German family. I think they married within one book for 500 years. Genetically, it's not a good idea. <laughs> and I'm not disrespecting my family, I'm just merely observing. Um, uh, I think in the last generation, 
they went outside of that book. On the eve of the great anti-French revolution, uh, the percentage of nobility in France was two. In Germany was one. In Poland, between 10 and 15. And guess what? Starting with medieval times, there was something called the Duke's Castle. Every Duke's warrior, when he was in his neck of the woods, would set up a similar council. I am not talking democracy. It was oligarchy with some democratic elements. They deliberated. Hmm. Uh, eventually, local deities emerged from that. The ducal and royal council uh, converted itself by the 14th, 15th century into a chancellery and the senate. So all the lords were in the Senate. Curiously enough, the Poles had laws against foreign titles. They didn't like you if you were a, a uh, prince of the Holy Roman Empire. Mm. Their titles were mostly military and uh, uh, court titles. So sword bearer or cup bearer, you could keep a title like this. Or vojny who was in charge, usually a veteran nobleman who was in charge of take, protecting women and children when everybody else was off on an, on an expedition from a given county. So they didn't mind titles that showed a lieutenant, that showed your merit, that showed hmm. your achievements uh, on the battlefield or in public service. They didn't like titles like the count or a baron. They thought those were pretentious, pretentious, and they undercut the, uh, 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 the hierarchy of merit among the nobility. The nobility referred to each other as sir, brother, or madam, sister. Panie bracie, panie siostro. In a way, they were very egalitarian. I'm not saying there were no differences because obviously, Everyone has heard about the Prince Radziwiłł. And also Poland made an exception. All the Rurikid and Gediminit princes. So the princes of blood from the Grand Duchy of Lithuania got to keep their titles. Those were not seen as pretentious. So, so you, have you have very strange arrangements already in place by the 15th century. Thank you, that's fascinating. Uh, and to, to, um, to amuse you even further, the, this massive nobility, I mean, percentage-wise, the people who participated from the 15th century on in the political process were more numerous than the Athenians, percentage-wise. Mm. In fact, that kind of a proportion of participants of freedom was not matched until the British Reform Acts of the 1830s and Jacksonian democracy in the United States of the 1820s in terms of sheer numbers and percentages. And democracy, by which I mean self-government, uh, started at the county level. So people would assemble usually in church or in a cemetery if it was too warm and talk. And then they would elect their representatives, give them special letters with instructions to the provincial deity. Then they would also elect people, deputies, to the national parliament called the same, which evolved from the royal debating society in medieval times. And it was divided into the upper house, the senate with the magnates, your dukes of Buckingham, and people that you don't have, who would be yeomanry in your instance, but in the Polish instance, they had coats of arms and they considered themselves and they were indeed legally nobility. 
sometimes quite poor. Um, it was a fascinating system. I've mentioned taxation tied to military service if you wanted to take the troops abroad, but there were also other features. For instance, in 1436, the king and the parliament agreed to introduce a new law. It was called Neminem Captivabimus, which means nobody shall be captured without a valid court verdict. That's habeus corpus, your habeus corpus, except 150 years earlier. 150 years earlier. And I'm not, uh, I'm not being smug here or I'm not beating the drum of Polish nationalism. I'm merely suge suggesting when there is love, when there is a common culture, you don't have to have uh, English everywhere. There can be Scotch, Scots, Welsh and Irish together, so long as the culture is common and it's infused with Christianity. Then there is a unity of the spirits which informs such laws. Uh, in 1505, the parliament and the king introduced a new constitution, which was called the Nihil Novi. That means nothing new about us without us. Do you happen to know how to say it in American? Nothing new about us without us. Is that one of the amendments? I no taxation without representation. Okay, yes. Except it was 1505, not 1776. Again, no smugness because the conditions propitious to freedom mm. grow in an analogous way if all the ducks are lined up properly. In 1573, upon hearing that Catholic fanatics massacred Protestants in Paris, a majority Catholic parliament passed a new law granting freedom of religion to the Protestants. And by this, I don't mean mainline, only mainline Lutherans and Calvinists, of course, but also the so-called sects including the anti-Trinitarians. And there was an automatic death penalty for rebaptizing everywhere else in Europe by the law of Constantine. Oh, the parliament was not done. While it was at it, it granted freedom of religion by the same act called Confederation of Warsaw to Jews and Muslims. So, you have in Poland, Polish Tatars who have fought in every war, insurrection, any time Poland was in peril and they still stayed loyal. I had a question why? Well, most of them by now, since they've been in the Grand Duchy of Lithuania since uh, po -po -po -po, uh, the 14th century, most of them are Catholic now. Mm. Have you ever heard about the most famous uh, uh, Polish Tatar? No, I haven't. From the Grand Duchy of Lithuania? He was born in America, Charles Bronson. That's why <laughs> right. he looked the yes. way he did. Okay. Yes. yes. Anyway, uh, but I'm not joking. The kid, yeah. when he was growing up in Pennsylvania, he spoke Polish until he was six, even though he was born in America. He was surprised he was born in America. Uh, there is a mosque, Polish, Tatar mosque in New York, and they still cultivate the Polish tradition, not a jihadi tradition. So all things are possible in proportion. So you have this unique development of Latin Christianity amongst the Slavic people in Poland. Notable achievements such as a, a flowering of the Gothic style, I think quite late in comparison to Oh, yes. France and England, but but uh, very impressive nonetheless. Um, and as you say, uh, an integration with 
wider Latin Christendom and communication with the papacy. But a unique society, very martial, as you said, I, I'm guessing because of its status as a frontier nation and having to deal with the Mongol threat, the Tatar threat, the, these sort of re- recurrent issues. Um, and then you have the, the Protestant Revolution. I, and as you say, an invasion of three distinct and mutually hostile forms of Protestantism, Lutheran, Calvinist and Unitarian, uh, Unitarian because the it- Italian anti-Trinitarian... Anti-Trinitarian. Yes, uh, Sogini, uh, otherwise known as Sicinus. Socinius, uh, uh, but he plagiarized the so-called Polish Aryan brothers. Now we're walking into the murky ground of heresy. I am prepared. Yes. Well, yes, well, I, I, I don't know. I'll explain. I don't know if I agree whether, you know, religious liberty is a, a good thing. You know, but, what but are you going it... to do with them? It, so long as you, um, as you proclaim supremacy, and I'll explain how it worked in Poland. Yes, yeah, so it's toleration as opposed to... Yes, rights. toleration, we yes. don't... Uh, yes, yeah, so we, tolerance We don't is... like it, but you're right. You, you have the right to be wrong. Yeah, yes, and I don't know if I would say hell. right. I don't know if I'd say right. I would just say toleration. You have the privilege to be wrong. But know? but by by defining it as a positive right, then that's I liable no. to bleed into yes. a yes, religious yes. indifferentism. Absolutely. But, Nothing lasts forever. There is no perfect system. And that's all they could come up with, seeing that Europe was drenched in blood. Yes, because of, of religious the religious wars. Yes. Yes, because um, of the Protestant Revolution. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Because... But, so, uh, because how was Protestant... Martin Luther, yes. Yes. So how, how was Poland saved from these heresies, given well, that there was a it... deep penetration of, of Protestant sects in the 16th century? And yet Poland is a real uh, success case study of the or case of the Counter-Reformation, the Baroque period. Yes. Well, uh, so first I will refer to a very fabulous point you made about architecture. It was all laid by um, the standards of England, France, Italy, and Germany, uh, because the Poles were learning from everybody else to the West. Uh, But I have a friend who is an art historian and she unearthed some kind of a Polish edition from the 17th century of a, a Roman uh, architectural guide textbook and she discovered that you could tell where that West ended by traveling and looking uh, at architecture. For instance, in Smolensk, she discovered a church which was like something she had seen in Rome. Mm. She was shocked. And I said, why are you shocked? My family is from the province of Mzislav, the ultimate uh, bulwark of Christendom about 200 miles away from Moscow to the West. That's where the Commonwealth ended. So yes, you have this. If you travel even today, there are remnants of Latin Christendom. As far as, far as the Protestant revolution It spent itself mostly in polemics in Poland without foreign interference, for instance, a Swedish invasion that would have been strictly a domestic affairs. You wouldn't believe how they they, they spat on each other, calumniated each other. Uh, The polemic was so fierce, but that by British standards, you would expect a Holocaust. Why? Like the Spanish culture, muerte this, muerte that, and then siesta, the Poles vent. So as I said, if you know Latin, if you, uh, uh, you know, even in, in Polish, the polemics are unbelievable. And I'll illustrate this with an account from the early 17th century. The Bishop of Lublin, during the uh, Corpus Christi procession, carried the host uh, and the people followed 
they sang hymns, suddenly a group of anti-Trinitarians and Calvinists jumped and beat up the bishop, stomped on the host, and there was a big tumult, uh, fisticuffs, nobody died. But desecrating of the host, according to the law of Constantine, uh, which the Poles adopted, uh, carried the death penalty. So the perpetrators were put on trial. They confessed without any torture. Uh, the bishop and other aggrieved parties, victims, testified against them. And then came the time to uh, uh, pronounce, pronounce the sentence. And the sentence could have only been one, death. Well, except for those who were sentenced to death and their partisans, everybody was um, happy. And then the bishop stood up to testify that uh, he was very satisfied with the sentence. And so was everybody else, except it shouldn't be carried out. And it wasn't carried out because it was Poland. Now, an English observer freaked out over certain Polish customs. Uh, there were English uh, nobility diplomats, there were English merchants uh, buying up grain in Gdańsk. Some of them ventured inland. And I'll, mention it. League, yes. I, I'll mention it uh, some more, but an English visitor witnessed uh, an egregious violation of law where all the estates lined up to petition the king. Anytime he left his private quarters in his castle, you could try to give him a letter. There were Swiss guards and other guards uh, armed with spears or halibards. And a nobleman trying to pass a letter pushed forth. So a guard hit him on his cheek with the with the butt of his weapon. So the nobleman unsheathed his saber. That carried an automatic death penalty because the king was present. I'll refer you to the Genroku Chushingura incident in Japan in 1702, where a, uh, a minor lord broke the seal and unsheathed partly his uh, weapon. And he was sentenced to seppuku. His estates were dissolved. Mm -hmm. Everything was confiscated. So in this case, the Englishman uh, was totally shocked because uh, uh, the nobleman was put on trial and he was duly sentenced to death, which was then commuted because the judge said, well, he didn't really mean it. So you have to take that under the consideration. You see the English, when they say there are rules, they mean it. And that is a cultural problem for the Poles. They don't like rules, especially rules which are not just. Uh, the rules express their spirit, which is even among those who have lost faith, infused with Christian charity. Because how would you explain this otherwise? There was a, a doctor, I think his name was O'Brien. Uh, he was a personal doctor to King John III Sobieski. He returned to England and wrote a fantastic book explaining that Poland or the Commonwealth was really a republic with a king who was elected. Mm. Uh, nobody took him seriously. It's a big book. I don't think anybody has published, republished it since the uh, late uh, 17th century, but it's fascinating because the physician uh, explained everything in a way that an, an English person, a Brit, a Scot, an Irish, and Welshman could relate to and it's all in plain print, so to speak. Uh, there was another device which you should know about, uh, which stems from old 
Slavic arrangements, namely in the royal councils and those deliberative bodies, dissent was allowed. Not that the duke or king was always happy, but dissent went beyond the fool. So the fool was comic relief and he could say anything he wanted to most of the time. But there was also a rule that if you were unhappy, you could say something. This eventually from medieval times developed into uh, the now infamous liberum veto. The mm. idea of liberum veto, I freely disallow, was to permit a minority, even a minority of one, to note his dissent. For over 200 years, nobody abused this power. Meaning you could stand up in the parliament and break the deliberations by shouting liberum veto, which, which would allow you to adjourn with a group and hammer out a compromise. After about 200 years in the second half of the uh, 17th century, Uh, Poland became what the United States of America is now. Namely, it was the only country in Europe which allowed openly foreign lobbies to operate in its capital. So the Chinese buy up senators or, I'm sorry, well, this never happens, and they offer special treatment to the powers that be who vote the way the Chinese like. In Poland, it was the Russian or the Prussian or the Austrian ambassador or French ambassador who bribed deputies to break the parliament. For instance, a Russian envoy would uh, take one rotten apple, pay him to interrupt the deliberations when, uh, when the military budget was under discussion. The parliament had operated for hundreds of years on the idea of unanimity, so there would be no tyranny. And so just you wouldn't think that I'm only dumping on the foreigners. How about great corporations? Meaning the magnates, mm. the senators, some of whom were in the pay of foreigners and others had their own agendas, would bribe a deputy to break deliberations, which invalidated all legislation passed in that session. Uh, the most important thing for a corrupt deputy was to run away. So sometimes they jump out the window, hop on the horse and gallop away. Because if they were caught, they would be forced to rescind it. But for hundreds of years, that system had worked and protected freedom. All the freedoms we're talking about. But freedom inevitably, as everything human turns into license, it degenerates. I hear in England, even uh, Hyde Park is not safe. Do you think you will be deplatformed? No, no, you don't have to answer. But you understand what I mean. Already, so yes. nothing, nothing lasts forever. When I look at the 18th century and the uh, uh, rottening of the Commonwealth, mm. the slow collapse, I think about the United States of America. The most prosperous, the most powerful, the freest commonwealth in Europe, puff, by the end of the, of the uh, 18th century was no more. It was partitioned between uh, Russia, Prussia, and Austria. And please don't blame the foreigners because as you know, the rot starts at home. The rot starts. So, uh, to go back to your question about the Protestant Revolution. As the times hardened, this wasn't only a question of, uh, of uh, counter-revolution, of the Catholic Restoration. It was also a question uh, of reacting to foreign interference and invasions. So once Protestant powers began invading and 
Orthodox powers like Russia. There was always a threat from Ottoman Turkey. Catholicism reasserted itself. Uh, the senior branch of my family went Calvinist, and that is how they abandoned Orthodox Christianity, Eastern Orthodoxy. They became Calvinist, but then the Swedes invaded. It was no longer sexy to be Protestant. Plus, the Jesuits brought better schools, and they turned Catholic within two generations. Uh, my family, uh, so not the clan, but the family, uh, I think we even had some Uniates or Greek uh, Catholics uh, in the 20th century. A cousin of my grandfather's who was shot in the cutting forest as one of the officers was a Uniate. So they are Greek Catholics who recognize the Pope from uh, 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 the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, but um, uh, most of our folks have been Catholic for a long time. And then, of course, Catholicism informs and infuses a, a Polish identity. But here is a trick. By Polish, we mean Everybody. Um, I have friends with, and family with last names as Fabiani. That's my family who came with Bona Sforza. Do they sound Polish? My great uncle Tadeusz Fabiani was shot by the Germans as a Polish uh, patriot in 1940, in June 1940. Sounds Italian. Yes, that's, they came with Bonas Forzas, who was a, became a Polish queen for Casimir uh, the Old. No, I'm sorry, Sigismund the Old. This was in the 15th, 16th century. Um, we have friends and relatives with names of uh, Totleben. They used to be Teutonic Knights. Mm -hmm. We have Polish cults of arms and Polish patriots. We have uh, the Velishes. Uh, we have s butlers. There is a famous story of, uh, of um, Michał Jałowiecki, Knyaz, or Prince Pierre Jesławski, one of the Ruri kids, who walked around in exile in Edinburgh in a kilt. And the Scots would ask him, well, are you a MacDonald? He said, yeah, my mother was a MacDonald. Of which MacDonald's? And he said, the Vilno MacDonald's. They fought for Bonnie Prince Charles and they escaped to the Commonwealth of Poland, Lithuania to enjoy freedom and their Catholicism. <laughs> so it's, it's, a, it's a very complex inside story and Europe's best kept secret. You had a Jagiellonian elite, essentially, most of whom could, could claim noble descent, including the foreigners, as I've mentioned. And then you had Catholic people, most of them ethnic Poles. Did you know that if a Jew converted to Catholicism, he was automatically ennobled by the constitution of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. But now you understand what nobility means. It means mm -hmm. you had to fight. But mm -hmm. some of them wanted to leave the ghetto and they had, they had enough of the tyranny of um, uh, the rabbis and they chose to convert. It's a, it's a very, it's a, very surprising story and it's completely mm. unknown and you can uh, only look to Chesterton who sampled it who had Polish friends and he loved what he see I'm just sorry he didn't have enough time to write about it but he got it nice. yes he got it Evelyn Waugh got it too and when you look at the support for Poland among 
British conservatives, you'll notice some of the Scottish lords. That's the Jacobite Sobieski connection because the descendants of Sobieski and uh, Bonnie Prince Charles intermarried. It's very strange. Yes. All of this is very strange. But it's all infused with Catholicism. So even if you're, I don't know, of Presbyterian background, you have this uh, patriotic inclination and reflex to look to Rome and to imagine things sometimes in mystical terms, but what propels us is faith. So nobody should be bothered except the evil ones. So you have this, this Catholic revival of the 17th century and the great triumph of the repulse of the Swedish deluge and the... the, those, the, were the wars of, those were wars of religion, but they were brought from the outside. Yes. And the, the uh, defense of the monastery of Yasnagora, oh. the growth of the cult of Our Lady of Chesterhova, and also you mentioned King Jan Zobievsky leading the, the Holy Army to finally defeat the, uh, the Ottoman Turkish threat, the last of the Mohammedan threat to Europe in 1688. But then, as you say, a decline into the 18th century. And what would, you, what would be your response, uh, Doctor, to the kind of regalist or French critique that the reason for this decline was Poland's weak monarchy, that this golden liberty allowed for too much aristocratic power? Well, uh, the critique is not only by the so-called enlightened philosophers like Voltaire. Uh, the critique is not only uh, uh, um, uh, the, uh, the narrative created by uh, Sophia von Anhalt, Zerbst, whom you know as Catherine the Great. The critique stems uh, precisely from the 16th century in the night of St. Bartholomew. The Poles elected one of the murderers their king, Henri de Valois. And he, feel, he felt extremely uncomfortable in Poland because he had to uh, swear on all those rights. We should be the dominant orientation. But as one of the Polish kings said, uh, the last of the Jagiellons, when the Protestants came and said, your majesty, let ha let's have a Polish religion. And the Catholics came and said, let's kick their butts. And the king said, I am not the king of your uh, conscience. Jesus is. So the kings, Polish kings, for better or worse, were as good as they themselves were. The institution, the institution doesn't make man. Man makes the institution. Uh, so, okay, you can claim, yes, we should have had royal absolutism like the Prussians and the Russians and, um, and the Austrians, but then we wouldn't be Poles, would we? Just like the English wouldn't be English if they weren't themselves. Like. So for better or worse, Nothing lasts forever. But we fight the good fight and at the same time, we're supposed to show love. It doesn't mean uh, that you can't punish because crimes must be punished. But you can punish crimes con amore. If there was anybody really trying to kill the king, did you know that unlike in France, not a single Polish king was assassinated? And one time there was an attempt on a Polish slash Swedish Vasa king by an insane guy who heard voices. Uh, and that, that's the extent of threats. Whereas yes. French monarchs were constantly under threat. Even the English, even in medieval times, the only Polish monarch who died was a, a prince who was 
who was almost rescued following a botched kidnapping. And the kidnappers who were Germans, Brandenburgs, slit his throat so, as, so he wouldn't be liberated. So it's interesting. So what do you do with tyrants? So what kind of a system do you maintain? As I said, if you expect perfection, that makes you a communist. Yes, they're or utopian. Some other utopia. Yes. If you do the best you can, and absolutely, would it would it have been better had Poland done something different and said it's a sure? And I'm not being fatalistic, because as I told you before, it's been promised to us that the gates of hell shall not overcome the kingdom of heaven, so we win in the end. We just have to fight. And the circumstances, well, at least for my family, have been down the hill for the last 300 years or so. <laughs> uh, 250. And there's been a respite since 1989. And there was a respite between 1918 and 1939. So I don't know. We have one life to live. We do what we can. We fight a good fight. Amen. We pray, we pray, and we uh, try to remain in a good mood. This is the key. Yes. Good mood, no matter what news we, uh, we, the English call it the stiff upper lip. It, that, yes. it can be that, it doesn't have to be that. And that's what I've noticed in your articles in Crisis Magazine regarding the current attacks of the revolution on Poland uh, regarding abortion. I, com I commend those. It's same with the United States. I mean, I don't change my mind about my, uh, 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 my new country. I I've been here almost 40 years, so. <laughs> so, so what was the effect of the, the enlightenment in Poland? You have the, the so-called enlightenment. The so-called, yes, the endowment. <laughs> Um, the second written constitution in the world, I believe. Well, um, it was... Was this the work of the Schlachter? Who, who, well, where did these currents come some from? Some of the Schlachter was... Okay, so the Enlightenment was a um, tough proposition. It led to a split between... Uh, the camps of the reformers. Uh, why? The most sexy ones turned to innovation. And the traditionalists hated any innovation, so both were at the loggerheads when they should have in, uh, united against external enemies to reform the country. Uh, the reformers, actually, the innovators, attempted to disenfranchise the petty nobility and enfranchise only people with money. Hmm. So you look at the constitution of May 3rd, 1791, and don't follow Edmund Burke's admiration. There were serious problems with it, uh, namely, they try to limit the franchise to those with money. And, the, uh, and the, the opinion was perhaps like the rotten boroughs. Well, perhaps, but these were not rotten boroughs. These were real human beings with rights. And the proposition was not to open up the franchise to others, but to cut off the traditional mainstay, the people whose collective mentality cherished and worshipped for the next 120 years when Poland was no more, the idea of freedom and the church. So those were the mainstay of every single uprising, every insurrection, every conspiracy, as well as organic work to build up the economy, to build schools. Those were people with roots who remembered, not commoners. I hope this, is, this comes across as snobbish enough. Uh, 
But the commoners were embraced. For instance, in the insurrection of Kościuszko, 1794, those peasants who fought were elevated. Burghers who fought were ennobled. The popular element entered the Polish scene outside of petty nobility in 1794, which was the beginning of the formation of a modern nation as opposed to political nation of various nationalities and ethnicities and one culture. Here, the culture stayed the same, but it opened its gates to everybody else, no matter what one's social station. So you can credit the reformers with that idea, but the reformers actually screwed up for they introduced reforms that would have made Poland powerful and restored its um, prestige. However, the reforms were inimical to Russia, Prussia and Austria so I don't know why the reformers were shocked to discover that those powers invaded. <laughs> Playing stupid until Napoleon came, whom I dislike, for obvious reasons, that was a good option. So sometimes the reformers jump the gun, staging uprisings when, when there is no hope for help is very romantic and lovely, but not traditionalist and conservative. Not that we didn't fight in those uprisings, but think before you jump. Yes, that, that's interesting because, so we have the, you, the partitions and the, the uh, sort of captivity of the Polish people, but a, a coalescence of national identity around the Catholic faith, Yes. Polish romanticism, oh, yeah. uh, even and the Polish nobility. nobility, and even Polish messianism, which yes. I want to ask your thought on this idea of Poland as the Christ of nations. Um, but then in, the, in one of the 19th century uprisings in 1831, I believe, part of that wave yes. of revolutions, My Pope Gregory the Pope Gregory the <laughs> I, I even have a list. Uh, in uh, central Poland, outside of Warsaw, outside of Płock, was Wulne and Przypust, the estates of Wulne and Przypust, because my um, uh, paternal uh, grandfather's ancestor, or great-great-great-grandfather, uh, ambushed the Cossacks on the bridge in Wrocław and fired at them. <laughs> so there was even a justification why. Uh, why the family was dispossessed and shipped to Siberia, of course. That's where the uh, panorama uh, Raklovitsch is. Raklovitska, that's 1794. Ah, yes. That's so, the Kościuszko insurrection. It looks incredible. I'd love the to battle visit. Of, yes, uh, the battle of Raklovitsa uh, uh, with the peasant scythemen uh, storming Russian cannon successful. <laughs> The uh, but in the 1830 uprising, Pope Gregory the 16th actually, I believe, condemns the uprising. Yes, because he yes, because he's supporting this holy alliance, which is holding back the forces of the revolution. Yes, in an post. absolutist way. But then he then reneges on his his condemnation when the Polish bishops uh, give him the full information about the condition of the the Polish people. Could you sort okay. of uh, expand on that a bit? So you started with God, and now. Finish with the devil or Marx. Marx loved Poland and the Polish nobility. He said they are a reactionary class, but they always revolt. So they are fantastic. They are destroying <laughs> the order in Europe. So yes. we must support them. He, he hated Slavic people. I mean, there is a book, Karl Marx, Racist. I highly recommend it from 1978. Um, and Karl... Karl Marx made an exception for the Poles because they kept rebelling, which people like the popes misinterpreted for a revolution. In the Polish language, uh, those events are called powstania, which means an uprising, never a revolution. Mm -hmm. There's a difference. The, Pol the Poles find, or Polish patriots, find the word revolution repulsive. Yes, so the uprising is actually a counter-revolution. 
in a uprising, sense. Sort of like Easter rising for the Irish, not yes. Easter revolution. Yes, because revolutions they are intrinsic. They wanted to bad. restore the Commonwealth. Yes. They didn't want to dispossess everybody and kill everybody. So the popes failed to see a distinction because what they observed was a rebellion against a legal king who happened to be the Tsar of Russia. I'm sorry, the Tsar never gave us our nobility. We don't recognize him. What are you, crazy? So this is very complicated again. Yeah. It doesn't mean there weren't leftists in Poland, the revolutionaries, for instance. Um, uh, there were uh, two officers who, uh, in my opinion, behaved in a disgusting manner, leading the Commune de Paris. But nobody's perfect, mm -hmm. even the Poles. <laughs> so uh, you've mentioned Romanticism, which romanticism? I like um, uh, the Count Krasinski, who was uh, the best reactionary poet who predicted communism in the middle of the 19th century and wrote yeah. about it. Undivine comedy, right? Read that. There are Is it in English? A, you can find now stuff in English. Krasinski. Uh, Count Zygmunt Krasinski. Of course, the most famous is Adam Mickiewicz because he was lefty, liberal, and she was the most messianic. He's most identified with, uh, identified with this idea of Poland as the Christ of nations. Poland died, but it'll be resurrected. It fed into Catholicism, but it was extremely radical and in a way sacrilegious. I understand that people with no hope try to find hope, and that's the case. There were clear-headed uh, people in Poland too, but those people tended towards treason because reality dictated uh, a necessity to at least accommodate the, the, the partitioning powers. Not my family, my family never learned even if it knew better, you know, <laughs> every single uprising. I think I'm the only male member of my family in a couple of hundreds of years who has not been wounded, killed on the battlefield, has not been in Auschwitz or uh, Siberia. Yeah, so I'm very unusual. Maybe that's why my uh, family got me out of Poland. <laughs> During martial law in 1982. And there's incredible capacity for hardship and suffering. I don't yes. know. Yes, if... martyrology. The Poles uniquely celebrate defeats. Yes. Uh, yes. Like the is... Irish in a way as well. Yes, in a way like the Irish, except the Irish do it in a somber and very mm. angry mood. The Poles <laughs> remember and they... Uh, I, I even saw a very recent poster a couple of years ago of so-called accursed soldiers, those who had continued after fighting the Nazis to combat the communists following World War II. So the, there is a, a, um, a picture of a, a, a Polish soldier with a broken saber saluting, and the caption reads, uh, they thought we were just manure when they buried us, but we were the seeds of freedom. See, that's messianism too. <laughs> Resurrection. And of course, the soldier had Our Lady on his chest. A ring graph, so a, a, a small shield with the depiction of Our Lady. Some of them had uh, a cross similar to the Van Dien's. Sacred Heart as well. Uh, like Sacred Coeur, yeah. Yes, yeah. Absolutely. It's, uh, yes, it's, uh, as I said, it's Europe's uh, most unknown story. Mm -hmm. It's extremely inspirational and exciting. Uh, yes, I know that there are Polish people who like to be Irish and morbid, no offense to the Irish, but Polish Catholicism is joyous. 
as opposed to the Irish Catholicism, which had suffered for so many years, maybe because Polish nobility, for the most part, never betrayed the people. If you wanted to stay noble in Ireland, you had to apostatize, right, keep your right. lands, or immigrate. The Polish nobility didn't, despite the pressure, confiscations, this and that and the other. The elite stayed. Mm. So maybe that is the secret, because then at your manor house, like in Elizabethan England, you could keep the chaplain and the symbol and help the spirit survive and teach your people about good and evil. And that's really the mystery of life, universally speaking. And that aristocratic spirit was part of the Polish soul, remains part of the Polish soul. I don't know if you're familiar with the Russian Nicholas uh, Badiev. Berdaev. But I, yes, absolutely. I, I have for here a, a, a piece of his writing from 1914. If you'll permit me uh, to Please. read a couple of extracts and, 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 and give me your response, because it's in, from 1914. It's entitled The Russian and the Polish Soul. And he talks about the age old historical dispute of Russia and Poland lying very deep. He says the heart of the antagonism is a dispute between two Slavic souls essentially the Slavic soul, which is Orthodox, the Russian, and the Catholic Slavic soul, the, Pol the Polish. And he said that Russia historically has wanted to preserve its Orthodox soul and its unique spiritual inheritance against uh, historic Polonization and Latinization. And then he says that in the typical Russian soul, there is much simplicity, directness, and a lack of cunning, foreign as it is to every affectation, every overwrought pathos, every aristocratic ambition, all the gesturing. This soul readily falls and sins, yet repenting even to the point of morbidity, it remains conscious of its own insignificance before the face of God. Within it, there is some sort of an especial, altogether non-Western democratism upon religious grounds, a thirst for the salvation of all the people. Everything remains in the depths of the Russian people and it is not wants to express itself in a plastically facile manner. In, Ru in Russian man, there is no, so little a sense of discipline, an orderly soul, a tempering of person. He is not extended out upwards in the stuff of his soul. There is nothing of the Gothic. Russian man expects that God himself will set order to his soul and arrange his life. In its utmost manifestations, the Russian soul is a wanderer, seeking for the city, not here present, and awaiting, awaiting its descent from heaven. The Russian people in its lower aspects is immersed in the chaotic, still pagan earthly element. But at its summits, it lives in apocalyptic expectations. It thirsts for the absolute and is not ready to settle for anything relative. Altogether different is the Polish soul. The Polish soul is aristocratic and individualistic to the point of morbidity. In it, so powerful is not only the sense of honor connected with the knight chivalrant culture unknown to Russia, but also an obdurate ambition. This is the most refined and elegant soul within Slavdom, drowning in its own suffering fate, pathetic to the point of affectation. The mannerisms of the Polish soul always strike Russians as artificially elegant and sweet, lacking in simplicity and directness and repelling in its sense of superiority and suspiciousness, of which the Polish are not free. The Polish have always seemed lacking in a sense of the equality of human souls before God, of brotherhood in Christ, as connected with the acknowledging of the infinite value of each human soul. The unique spiritual aspect of the Polish nobility has poisoned Polish life and played a fateful role in its state des destiny. Russian man is little capable of such soul, a scorn. He does not love to give another man the feeling that he is lower than him. Russian man is proud in his humility. The Polish soul, however, draws upward. This is the Catholic spiritual type. The Russian soul prostrates itself stretched before God. This is the Orthodox spiritual type. With the Polish soul, there is a love for affectation. With the Russians, however, there is altogether no affectation. In the Polish soul, there is an experiencing of the path of Christ, the sufferings of Christ and the sacrifice on Golgotha. So that, that, that's obviously from a Russian author with his own particular perspective, but 
I wonder what your it, thoughts are. It's, it, it's very difficult to, to tackle with a fish and hoof. But um, if you want me to be tongue in cheek, I'd say that Birdaev was describing the attitude of the Russian peasant towards the state. Individuals don't exist. The state matters, and that's all that matters. Like in the Mongol horde, only the Khan was an individual. Everybody else was a slave. So he mistakes spirituality for subservience. At the same time, as far as the Polish soul, we are saved individually. So he's saying the Poles are Christians and the Russians are not? The Poles, the Poles he, he, he attacks the Poles for being individualists. How but he praises the Poles Saint as well. Peter, how else is St. Peter going to assess our eligibility for the Paradise Hilton Hotel? if not individually. Prostration doesn't cut it. And to quote a Polish political philosopher from a hundred years ago, the higher type of a human being I represent, the greater my duties. And I have every right to be proud of my devotion and the way I discharge my duties so long as I don't, don't fall into bragging and impudence because that would be offensive to God. We differentiate ourselves and we are differentiated by how we are individually. Any individualism tends to be aristocratic. There is no other way. If you want collectivism, seek orthodoxy. Remember, there is a big difference between Caesaropapism and the division between the church and the state. So that is also a problem for the Russian stone. Now, I have a step cousin. They're really friends of my family who's an Orthodox nun every day in Mount Etna, California. Shemanan Serafima is her name. She prays for me every day, I know, even though she's a cloistered nun and I can't be in touch with her, only through her uh, archbishop. She prays for me every day uh, because I'm going to hell, because I'm Catholic. And I love her to pieces. She comes from an illustrious family, the Sheremietievs, a uh, Russian family, very decent, uh, very decent people. Her mother is Georgian. And uh, she couldn't find a place for herself in the world uh, ravaged by totalitarianism in the 20th century. She's younger than me. She became a nun. I love her to pieces and I miss her horribly. She's... You know, it is what it is as far mm. as orthodoxy. But I think uh, we need to heal the wound and not through false ecumenism, but through Christian love and invite them back to the fold. It cannot happen so long as they are intertwined and genetically connected to the state, Moscovite state, because they mistake Christ for Caesar, for the for the, the czar. And that is not who we are. So otherwise, I have no quarrel with Bedaya. Yes, he and I think he acknowledges the the great lights in the Polish soul that you still see today. It, it, it's still a habit for Polish men to kiss the hand of, of women. Of course, and the peasants do that. This yes, is, this which is, is but it's a very noble gesture. It's uh, actually a, a feudal recognition of uh, uh, a, a token of respect. So you know, I opened one time. I opened the door to uh, um, uh, a, a, a colleague of mine 
in graduate school, that must have been 30 years ago or so. And she yelled at me because she was a feminazi. And I said, Fran, I thought good manners were internationalists. And she got offended even more. Uh, it's not a sign of weakness. My grandmother taught me to yield space. I was 10 years old, maybe 12, I was on a bus in Copenhagen. A pregnant woman came in. I stood up because there were no spaces to seat and um, uh, to sit down, no seats. And uh, uh, I stood up and she yelled at me too. But I didn't care because my grandmother told me that should be the reflex. If you're a boy and you, again, once again, you kneel down before Our Lady, you have no problems women or anything else, you know who you are. So it is what it is. 